Hi, this is Bob Bostock, and welcome to Discover DEP, the official podcast of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Each week, we talk with DEP experts about how we protect and preserve New Jersey's air, water, land, and natural and historic resources. So that you'll never miss one of our podcasts, please subscribe to Discover DEP on iTunes or Google Play. You can also follow DEP on the web at nj.gov DEP. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy our podcast. Hi, this is Bob Bostock, and welcome to another edition of Discover DEP. This summer here in New Jersey, we're seeing an abnormally high number of ticks and other pests in our backyards, in our parks, our forests, playgrounds, and even along the shore. For all of us, there's nothing more unwelcome than uh, having pests bother us while we're out there, biting us, or eating the food if you're on a picnic or any of those other things, biking, hiking, camping, etc. But these pests are unavoidable. So it's very important as we are outside and these pests are out there with us that we follow certain safety precautions to not only make sure that none of these pests, some of which can spread disease, uh, bother us, or that our summer adventures are otherwise hampered by the presence of these pests. So today, to talk about some of these pests and the steps that we can take to avoid having unpleasant encounters with them, we're joined by Jim Osi, who's a PhD graduate student in entomology at Rutgers University, the state university, and he's here to tell us a little bit more about these pests and what we can do to keep ourselves safe and avoid having them ruin our outdoor experiences this summer. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate your coming down to Trenton. Jim, I understand you told us this is only your second time in Trenton. Correct. First time since a fourth grade field trip. This is true. So we're glad to have you back in our state capital. Let's start with ticks. Ticks, of course, everybody knows that uh, they can spread Lyme disease. There's all sorts of ticks out there, not just one. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about ticks in New Jersey. Let's start with how many different species of ticks do we find in New Jersey? There's probably 10 to 12 species of tick that you could find in New Jersey, but the three major ones are the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis, uh, the lone star tick, Amblyum americanum, and the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis, and they each transmit their own type of infectious disease. So what family are ticks? Are they arachnids? Are they insects? Correct. They're arachnids. They're arachnids. So it's kind of like a spider. Correct. Which means they have eight legs. Yep. All right. See, I, I remember something from biology. Except in the larval stage where they have six. Really? Yes. Interesting. So ticks, uh, why do they latch on to warm-blooded creatures? Because they're obligate blood-feeding parasites. In other words, all they can eat is blood, and that's the only thing they can eat. That's their entire so diet. That's it. And they need to feed on a vertebrate in order to get that blood. So when I find a tick, for instance, on my dog, which we do occasionally, even though we treat our dog with anti-tick stuff, Usually they they look kind of engorged or something. Is that the blood they've gotten? In? Correct. They'll if it's a, a deer tick, for instance, that usually come out in the fall, they'll feed from five to seven days. And they'll be maybe five, six, seven, eight times their original size before they were feeding. You're right, the term is engorgement. That's the proper term. Yeah, it looks it almost looks like a, kind of a seed, the back of them and, and it's like you can't see any other part of the tick. Yeah, and it's, and it's difficult to identify ticks when in that stage. So how can you tell these different ticks apart? That's a complicated question with a complicated answer, so let's simplify it and just look at the females. So the female black-legged tick or deer tick has a red abdomen. They usually come out in the fall because they come out the same time as a deer or mating season or the rut. In the summer, we have the adult lone star tick and American dog tick. The lone star tick has a white or the female has a white spot on her back. And she also has what are called festoons on the lower part of her abdomen. The American dog tick also has these festoons, but no white spot. But she does have these white or gray markings on her body. And I should also mention that the black-legged tick does not have festoons. It's called an inornate tick. And it's not as elaborately ornamented as the lone star tick and the dog tick. So, Jim, these uh, ticks, on average, what's their size? Well, the adult stage of, let's say, the the black-legged or deer tick, may be two or three millimeters, whereas the nymph stage will be about a millimeter. They're very small. That's very small. Yes. You would need a, uh, a magnifying glass or something to really see them. Very small. The size, the head of a pin, 
less than two millimeters, very small. Really? Yeah. I've heard less like than a millimeter. Yeah. Like the size of a sesame seed or something. Even smaller. Even smaller. Yes. And they also feed on blood. The next. Correct. And they're responsible for ninety-five percent of the cases of Lyme disease because they're so small. Plus, they emerge in May, June, and July when everyone's wearing shorts and short sleeve shirts. So even though the uh, adult tick doesn't appear until the fall, we need to be looking out for those nymph deer ticks. Yeah, they're the most dangerous. They're the, they're the ones that transmit the Lyme disease. Do the other ticks uh, transmit diseases as well? Sure. Um, the American dog tick can transmit the agent of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and the agent of Tularemia, which is also known as rabbit fever. And the Lone Star tick can transmit um, ehrlichiosis, the agent of ehrlichiosis, and can sometimes also transmit um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Tularemia. And are those diseases common in New Jersey? They're not as common as Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease, New Jersey has thousands of cases every year, probably 10% of the country's caseload. We have a lot, but fewer Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Ehrlichia cases. And I, and I might add that the black legged or the deer tick can also transmit the agent of anaplasmosis, the agent of babesiosis, and the agent of po the, the virus for Powassan virus. So All of those viruses sound pretty, pretty scary. Yeah, one virus and three bacteria. Wow. Yeah. Oh, one protozoan. I stand corrected. Okay, so if somebody is bit by a deer tick, uh, kind of what symptoms will they get? How will they know that that's happened, particularly since the in the nymph stage they're so small? There's a good chance you're not going to know you've been bitten because the saliva has things that reduce the swelling and inflammation. Plus, they're so darn small. So a lot of people don't even know they're bitten. And you so may... it's not like a mosquito bite where it swells Correct. up and, and it itches. Correct, because mosquitoes have to look for a blood vessel, and they'll probe a little bit injecting saliva each time they probe, and that saliva is causing the itching. But in ticks, they're pool feeders. So they just make a little lesion in the skin and wait for the blood to leak in, and that's how they feed. And they'll feed for two to three, four days. So they can be on you for several days. Correct. And if you bathe or take a shower, they can still stay on there. Correct. Right? Oh, that's a little they have, uh, <laughs> Yeah, they have uh, recurved teeth on their mouth parts called a hypostome, and they get a good grip. And so some kind of ticks... Like getting a hook into you. Exactly. Yeah. And some ticks will secrete cement. Really? Yeah. To keep them on there. Right. Wow. For a small creature, pretty clever. Very complicated. <laughs> no doubt about it. What can people do to guard themselves against being bitten by a tick or, and, and to protect their uh, domestic pets from them? Okay, well, let's take your yard, for example. So let's say you have a yard and you have wood surrounding your yard. During the winter, you could cut back the lower vegetation and rake out all the leaf litter. You can also put up a warning track between the woods and your yard, just like a baseball warning track, telling anyone, hey, don't go past this warning track. There's ticks out here. To personally protect yourself, if you're going to go hike in the woods, stay on the trails. Don't go wandering into the woods. For your personal protective measures, you can use insect repellent on your skin. There's a few different types. You can tuck your pants into your socks because the first thing a tick does is crawl upwards, and this way they can't get under your pants. Mm. And you can either also put permethrin on your clothes, which is an insecticide, and you don't put it on your skin. You can only put it on your clothes. So insecticides that you could use uh, containing DEET, would that be one that would protect you against? Yeah, DEET's a repellent, so you, would, right. you could put that on your skin. And that would uh, repel the ticks. Correct. Good. And what about your domestic pets, cats and dogs? Yeah, it, there's a lot of commercial things available, like the, the spot-ons and the collars, and the, there's even oral treatments now. And I'm not well-versed in those things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But there are... Plenty, uh, plenty. People can talk to their veterinarians and get some suggestions. Like plenty of options. Protect their dogs and cats. From Unfortunately, you can't put those on humans. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we look good wearing tick collars. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Jim, after you've been outdoors, it's usually a good idea to check and see if you picked up any ticks. And if you do find that there are ticks attached to you, what are some of the easiest and best ways to remove them? Well, the best way is to take a uh, pair of fine tip forceps, get as close to the skin as possible, and just pull backwards. Um, the faster you remove it, the lesser your chance of becoming infected if it is going to transmit anything. Putting Vaseline on it, lighting it with a match, putting gasoline on it. It's not going to work. Um, just pull it out. Yeah. And you want to get close to the skin so you get the head, right? Correct. So you get you get the mouth parts out. And if the mouth parts do, do stay in, the, the body will reject it. It will. So it's because the ticks have those, uh, their, their teeth. Are they teeth or pro? Well, they have, they, they have a, they have what's called a chelicerae that will dig into the skin. 
like a ratchet mechanism. They'll dig in like a reciprocating saw and then they'll insert the hypostome. So those three things are going to be in the skin. They may, you, usually you can remove them when you pull them out, when you pull a tick out. They usually come out, but sometimes they stay in. But the body usually rejects it. And just keep an eye on it. Make sure there's no secondary infection from normal bacterial, normal skin bacteria. But just grabbing it by the body with your finger is not a good idea. You'll leave too much behind. Yeah, plus if you squeeze it, it might transmit something to you. Jim, as you describe ticks and mosquitoes, you know, we think of them as kind of simple little pests. But in fact, they're pretty complicated animals, aren't they? Yeah, very complicated. For instance, a tick has to feed for, let's say, five to seven days and take in a lot of blood, but it doesn't want the host to know it's being fed upon. So it has to secrete things from the saliva that keep the host from not knowing what's going on. Plus, they have to get rid of a lot of the water that's in the blood. So they'll just secrete that back into your body. And they have complicated lifestyles, some of them. Some will actually hunt for a host that's there's none of those ticks around here. But most of the ticks around here will quest. It's called questing. And what they'll do is they'll hang off the vegetation, just waiting for something to come by. Like to brush against the leaves or and the grass. Yes. You have to brush up against it. They don't. They can't hop, skip, jump, or fly. So when I go out and I collect ticks, and I'll, in some areas you can see them hanging off the blades of grass. There's so many of them. And if you blow on them, their forelegs will raise up in the air because they have carbon dioxide sensors in their forelegs. So they can detect the breath of a potential host. So that's how they know somebody might be coming along who uh, might be able to provide them with a meal. Exactly. Ticks, of course, are not the only pests that are out there in the summertime. What are some of the other pests we have here in New Jersey? That the big one eat? right around now is the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus. Came to the United States in the mid-80s and moved from in Houston, I think, and it moved its way north and now entrenched in New Jersey. If you go out in your backyard, if well, me in particular, I get slammed and I... Some other people don't, but they like they're day biters. They can bite during the day. During the day, because yeah. most mosquitoes are at dusk. Yeah, some are at dusk or at night, but these things are day biters and they're very aggressive. So that's one thing. And like the ticks, we we talked about the females are the are the female ticks the only ones that feed on blood, and is it the same true of mosquitoes, or how does that work? No, with with ticks, each stage has to feed the larvae, the nymph, and the female adult. The male ticks usually do not feed, although some species will, they usually do not feed. Um, but as you mentioned, mosquitoes, it's only the female that feeds on blood usually. Mm. I've heard people say that they feel that they're a mosquito magnet and they can be next to somebody in the yard or uh, out in the park and that person's not getting any mosquito bites. Is, is, is there something to that? Do certain people attract mosquitoes and others not necessarily? There is something to that, but I don't know what it is because I'll sit in my backyard with my wife and I'll get slammed and she won't get anything. Really? It could be odors given off by bacteria on our skin, the fungi and bacteria on our skin, the odors from our perspiration or lactic acid, uric acid, anything secreted in your sweat. I'm not suggesting I smell more than my wife, but... Well, you certainly wouldn't suggest your wife smell more Not than at all. Not. <laughs> Some people just have a magnetic personality. Correct. That probably has something to do with it as well. How do you protect yourselves against uh, mosquitoes? The same sort of measures you do with ticks? Yes, I use a DEET, and I have to do that just to go out in my backyard. Really? Very difficult to control because they're container breeders. So if you have uh, young children at home, you have a sandbox, and you have plastic toys in there, any water sitting in there is a great breeding spot for these Asian tiger mosquitoes. And they don't need like a big pond or anything. They can breed in a very small amount of water, can't they? Correct. And to that point, most mosquitoes don't breed in a pond because the fish will eat them. Ah. Yeah. It's usually uh, a little eddy in a pond, perhaps, or tree holes, or like I said, plastic containers. Yeah, so maybe if you leave your frisbee upside down in the yard. Exactly. Yeah, that's a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. What kind of diseases do the Asian tiger mosquitoes transmit? The Asian tiger mosquito can potentially transmit the viruses of chikungunya, yellow fever, and Zika. The major vector of those uh, viruses is Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, which occasionally shows up in New Jersey but it's not, a st it's not a resident like the Asian tiger mosquito is. Yeah, now the Zika, I understand there was a lot of concern, particularly last summer about that, because there were a lot of cases popping up down in Rio where the Summer Olympics were being held, and I know a lot of athletes were concerned about going down there. And, of course, in the southern United States, uh, we saw quite a bit of Zika, uh, not so much here in New Jersey. Yeah, but in Miami, yeah. There, and there were locally acquired cases. There were, um, and those were acquired uh, uh, usually when people were traveling. Well, I, if I, my understanding is correctly, those, they did have mosquitoes down there that did transmit it locally. So that was a problem. Down in Miami. Yes. Yeah. 
here in New Jersey, though, we didn't have any local no. transmission. No. And uh, certainly our, our uh, mosquito control commissions uh, in our counties and, and our Office of Mosquito Control here at DEP are working very closely uh, both to monitor the, the uh, population of all of our mosquitoes, uh, keeping a particular eye out for the Aedes aegypti, uh, as well as assisting in mosquito control efforts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, besides making sure there's no standing order around your home, what other measures can people take to uh, make their homes and yards less hospitable to mosquitoes? One thing in particular, again, it has to do with standing water, but not many people think of this, are those corrugated drain spouts on the edge of your downspouts. Mm -hmm. If they're not draining, they're going to hold a lot of mosquito larvae. So just those little... uh Corrugated, corrugated, plastic, little bridges, little, usually kind of, green. Yes. Yeah, they just they house a lot of mosquito larvae. Is that right? Yes. And are there uh, natural predators for the mosquito larvae besides the fish? Do any birds eat them? Bats? Uh, well, the larvae. There's a thing you can buy called Bacillus thuringiensis, and it comes in a little donut, and uh, you just throw it in the water, and it kills the larvae. It has a little bacterium in it that makes a protein that kills the the uh, mosquito, but doesn't harm anything else. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, we we distributed last year through DEP uh, several tens of thousands of those donuts across ah. the state to uh, encourage people to use them in their ponds and, and wherever there might be standing water that they mm-hmm. could not readily disperse. So we've covered ticks and mosquitoes. What other pests should we be aware of? Well, in some of the more civilized, or I should say less rural areas, we have bed bugs to worry about. And we have a, a very good expert at Rutgers Entomology, Cheng Lung, who, who uh, received a number of awards for his studies on bed bugs. And he does a lot of work in New Jersey. But anything outdoors, I don't know of any other bugs that attack humans off hands. We do have a couple other insect pests that are invading our agricultural systems, mm-hmm. like the marmorated stink bug and um, the Asian lanternfly, I believe it's called. The lanternfly is in Pennsylvania as we speak, and it's probably going to come here shortly, but they're monitoring the situation, and hopefully it won't come in. So those are invasive pests that are Correct, and here. the vegetation and not people. Uh, what about bees and wasps and hornets and yellow jackets and stuff? Yeah, I think they're just a yearly problem, although I read a report that New York State is having a problem with their bee colonies because of the mite problem. We're seeing some collapse in the colonies, yeah. Correct. Correct. And I don't know about New Jersey. But in terms of uh, people getting stung by bees and stuff, usually to annoy them, they kind of prefer to leave you alone, don't they? Yeah, that's, that's my understanding. Yeah. And uh, certainly I've heard uh, anecdotally through the years uh, the, the yellow jackets, which tend to nest on or near the ground, you're out cutting the grass or doing some weeding, keep an eye out for that because they get very unhappy. Yes, so that happened to me a couple of weeks ago cutting my grass. Yeah, okay. So um, they can be pretty aggressive. And yes, but especially if you go over their nest with a lawnmower. Otherwise, it's best just to kind of avoid them. Uh, So, Jim, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get interested in bugs? (laughs) Well, I I was going for a master's degree at Seton Hall back in the 90s, and I wanted to do a thesis. I heard about this thing called Lyme disease, and I said, well, do we have this Lyme disease thing in New Jersey? So I did a little reading, went out and learned how to collect ticks and found them, looked at the ticks closely uh, with a DNA technique called PCR, and found that in this one park that I sampled, 50% of the adults were infected with the Lyme spirochete. So that's pretty high. And unfortunately, that's standard for a lot of areas. And, and keep in mind, I said the adult ticks. The nymphal ticks, the ones that normally transmit it, are maybe maybe 20 to 25% infected. So that's probably the good news. Yeah. Um, so that's how I got all started. I went for a master's at Seton Hall and been interested ever since. And uh Finally, it's decided at 58 years old to go for a PhD in ticks. Well, good for you. Thank you. I believe I have read somewhere that if you added the total biomass of insects on the planet and compared it to the biomass of human beings, the insects would win. Yeah, they would. would. In fact, the most common animal on the earth, or the most numerous, is are the beetles, the coleoptera. Is that right? If I remember from my class last semester. Well, I'm sure you do, because I'm sure you passed that class with flying colors. I wouldn't say flying colors, but <laughs> I passed. So how much longer do you have until you get your PhD? Probably three more years. Three more years. A while ago. Have you started your dissertation yet? Yes. I'm out collecting ticks every weekend. And what's the uh, title of your dissertation? I know it's, it has to be long, and it has to have a colon in it. So no, no, no. I'll make it short. Pathogens in Ticks in New Jersey. How's that? That's a good one. Yeah. Wow. I'm, 
when, and they've accepted such a short title without a colon. Yeah, well, there's going to be a couple chapters, and I'm sure it's going to expand. Okay, good, good. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for uh, coming in and, and sharing with us your knowledge about ticks and mosquitoes and other pests that we find in the great outdoors here in New Jersey, and giving us some really useful tips on how to protect ourselves, particularly from those pests that are disease-bearing. I'm sure everyone knows someone who has Lyme disease or may have it themselves. It is a difficult disease to treat, and it can become a real chronic issue. So taking the precautionary steps to prevent being bitten by deer ticks or other ticks, and and certainly the diseases that are borne by mosquitoes, also very important to take the very easy-to-do steps to uh, prevent getting infected by any of these pests. makes a lot of sense and can keep you healthy, and so you can really enjoy the beautiful summer that we are having and will continue to have here in the Garden State. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for coming down to Trenton. We're glad to uh, be the recipient of your second visit to our state capitol (laughs) as a lifelong New Jerseyan. And I hope you'll come and see us again soon. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about ticks. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to Discover DEP. If you have comments on the podcast or ideas for future podcast topics, please email us at podcast at dep.nj.gov. Enjoy the rest of your day.